mentioned a moment ago, today is Respect Life Sunday. This is the Sunday each year, the first Sunday in October, when the church draws our attention ever more emphatically to the cause of the sanctity of life. I, like many of you, have been deeply committed to the pro-life cause for all of my adult life. But I've come to sense of late that the cultural environment in which you and I are carrying out our pro-life commitment has, within the span of a relatively few years, changed, subtly but quite discernibly. Perhaps it's because we had labored for the entire eight years of the previous administration against the backdrop of the first presidential administration in our nation's history that had consciously positioned itself as an adversary of the church, and not coincidentally as the best friend Planned Parenthood ever had in Washington. Or, alternatively, perhaps it's because we currently have the most demonstrably pro-life president in history. And we hope beyond hope that his numerous pro-life initiatives and his judicial appointments will have a lasting impact. Or perhaps it's because it seems that so many of our fellow warriors in this struggle had over time become tired and frustrated and maybe even a little bit dispirited. So here's my kind of bottom line analysis of what I believe has truly changed the positive shift in Washington notwithstanding. To state it as simply as I can, we now live in a culture that has lost its way because it has lost its fundamental sense of what is true, of what is real. As faithful Christians, as faithful Catholics, we have been drawn unwillingly into what I would characterize as a toxic cultural game of let's pretend, let's pretend. I'm speaking specifically in the context of the pro-life cause, of course, on this Respect Life Sunday, but we see this phenomenon manifested in countless ways within our society where you and I are constantly challenged to deny truths and realities that we know to be true intuitively, experientially, and factually, and to affirm ones that we know to be false. Just a few examples. A government and a media, along with many others, that pretend that same-sex relationships can be the same thing as marriage. A popular culture that cavalierly pretends that there are an indeterminate number of identifiable genders and tries to force all of us to participate in the pretense. A mainstream media and leftist politicians who pretend that the recent violent rioting in America's cities is really mostly peaceful protests and also that to call a deadly vi virus that obviously generated, originated in Wuhan, China, that to call it the Wuhan virus or the China virus is racist. And more to the point, an abortion industry, and make no mistake about it, it is an industry. It is in fact both a corrupt business and a demonic ideology and is the most sacred of the left's sacred cows, an industry that pretends that a preborn baby is anything but a baby, except when it comes to negotiating with customers for the sale of the baby's body parts. 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off, for truth has fallen in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. 
truth has fallen in the public squares. What we are facing today in our culture is among all the other things that it is, a crisis of truth. What we are seeing everywhere we look is a blatant denial and disregard of truth and of clear and manifest reality. Of course, this is the logical outcome of the relentless bombardment of our society by decades and decades of atheistic secularism and relativism, where every point of view counts, regardless of its foundation in truth or the lack thereof. This approach is perfectly innocuous when it comes to opinions on ice cream flavors or makes of automobiles or places to live, but it is absolutely deadly when it comes to opinions that undermine and upend the natural law, the word of God, and centuries of Judeo-Christian moral and cultural consensus. One of the most chilling statements ever to emanate from the United States Supreme Court was in the majority opinion in the 1992 case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which served to greatly liberalize abortion laws even beyond where Roe v. Wade had taken them 19 years earlier. The statement I'm referring to was part of the majority op opinion written by Justice Anthony Kennedy. Listen carefully to his words. Quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence of meaning, and of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Let me read that to you again. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, and of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. If it's not clear to you what the implications of that assertion were and are, let me tell you that it represents a clear abandonment by the highest court in this land for the object objective distinction between good and evil and between what is objectively true and false and it thus both reinforces and codifies a culture where all opinions, all sentiments, all passions and all views of what is good and what is true are given equal merit and equal recognition under the law. A little sidelight here. Given the opinion that he expressed in 1992, it is neither surprising nor coincidental that this same Justice Anthony Kennedy would write the majority opinion in Obergefell versus Hodges, which was the 2015 Supreme Court case legalizing so-called same-sex marriage that simply but blatantly ignored the natural law and self-evident reality. Again, we live in a culture that has lost its way because it has lost its fundamental sense of what is true. And yet you and I have been entrusted with the truth, the absolute truth of God's word. And 2,000 years of the authoritative teaching of the church in an age and a culture that increasingly neither recognizes nor values the truth. The government, the secular media, the entertainment industry, much of the education establishment, and the Silicon Valley technocracy have become quite adept at distorting or ignoring the truth whenever and however it suits their ends to do so. Historically, I'm reminded of Joseph Goebbels, the man whom Adolf Hitler appointed in the 1930s to the position of Minister for Public Enlightenment and propaganda for the German Third Reich. To my knowledge, the only quote for which Goebbels is remembered is this, which served as the foundation for his counsel to Hitler. Quote, if we tell a lie big enough and repeat it often enough, people will eventually come to believe it, end quote. It would seem that that principle is alive and well in our society today. On the other hand, the great Catholic author G.K. Chesterton once wrote that if you reject the truth of God, the danger is not that you will believe in nothing, but that you will believe in anything. 
There's a whole segment of contemporary society that believes and professes that there is no absolute truth, that all truths and values are subjective and relative, and so they act and behave accordingly. Tragically, many of those who believe that way are in positions of great power and influence in our societal institutions. And from those positions, they are able to corrupt the dissemination of truth to society at large and thus influence great numbers of people. Thus, the common perception, for example, that a preborn baby is not a human person or that those who adhere to the sanctity of marriage are hateful and homophobic, or that all religions are equally valid or invalid as the case may be, but that those who are steadfastly devoted to the Christian gospel and to the, to, to the church, you and I, are dangerous extremists. Against this seemingly overwhelming backdrop of lies and deceit, Jesus' words resound in our collective consciousness, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Those who live the lie find themselves not free, but rather living in a self-imposed bondage from which only the truth can free them. And brothers and sisters, that's where you and I come in. I want to suggest to you this morning that amidst all the frustration, all the weariness, all the anxiety, maybe even the dispiritedness we may be feeling over our efforts in the cause of life, the single most important commitment we can make and must make is our commitment to stand for the truth, no matter what, to stand for the truth, but with one important qualification. We need to stand for the truth while consistently and authentically walking in love. Speaking the truth in love. As St. Paul encourages us in Ephesians 4.15. That is not only a clear biblical admonition it is also, I believe, a most important goal of the gospel of life. It is, in fact, the defining hallmark of the pro-life movement, speaking the truth in love. In a recent homily, I referenced a brief life history of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. This morning, I'd like to go uh, to add just a little bit of detail of that history to tell you something very compelling about Dr. Nathanson's life. Bernard Nathanson represented in his life what the casual observer might deem a profound paradox. Few people did more to advance the deadly cause of legalized abortion than he did, and yet ultimately few people waged a more articulate and compelling battle against it. In his early life, Nathanson impregnated his girlfriend and then both persuaded her to have and paid for her then illegal abortion. Many years later, he would write that that event was, quote, his introductory excursion into the satanic world of abortion. After becoming a medical doctor, he founded and directed two organizations that arguably were at the epicenter of those that advanced the cause of abortion in America. One was the Manhattan-based Center for Reproductive and Sexual Health, where he presided by his own acknowledgement over more than 75,000 abortions, personally performing more than 5,000 of them, including two in which he snuffed out the lives of his own pre-born children. The other organization which he co-founded in 1968 and led as its first president was the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, later renamed the National Abortion Rights Action League and known today as NARAL Pro-Choice America. In 1980, Bernard Nathanson stopped performing abortions. 
And in 1985, he produced the bombshell in vitro video entitled The Silent Scream, giving clear evidence that Bernard Nathanson had completely and permanently been converted to the pro-life cause. In 1996, Nathanson, a previously a self-professed Jewish atheist, was baptized and confirmed in the Catholic Church by Cardinal... <coughs> by Cardinal John O'Connor in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. He chose as his godmother, Joan Andrews Bell. Many of you in the pro-life movement know that name. Joan Andrews Bell was a woman so steadfast in defending the life of the preborn that she had spent a year, a full year in prison for blocking the entrances to abortion mills. Nathanson spent the rest of his life relentlessly championing the pro-life cause. He died in 2011, God rest his soul, and was buried from the church in a funeral mass celebrated by Cardinal Timothy Dolan, again in St. Patrick's Cathedral. So what was it that brought about this monumental change in Bernard Nathanson's life? He once wrote that what converted him to the pro-life cause was ultrasound technology. And what converted him to Christianity was the compelling witness of pro-lifers. Allow me to translate. The truth made him pro-life. And love made him a Christian. The man who had ardently dedicated his entire early life to the utter lie of abortion was eventually won over by an incontrovertible exposition of the truth in the beautiful sonogram image of the baby in the womb. And the man who had steadfastly denied the existence of God could not help but be won over by the manifest sacrificial love which he witnessed in God's people. The biographer Bernard Nathanson recounts the following life-changing event. Quote, Along came the fateful January morning at a planned parenthood clinic on Manhattan's Lower East Side, where Nathanson witnessed 1,200 pro-life demonstrators. Wrapping their arms around each other, singing hymns, smiling at the police and the media, Nathanson circled about the demonstrators doing interviews, taking notes, observing the faces. It was only then, Nathanson wrote in his book entitled The Hand of God, that I apprehended the exaltation, the pure love on the faces of that shivering mass of people surrounded as they were by hundreds of New York City policemen. He listened as they prayed for the unborn for the women seeking abortions, for the doctors and nurses in the clinic, for the police, and for the reporters covering the event. They prayed for each other, but never for themselves, he wrote. And I wondered, how can these people give of themselves for a constituency that is and always will be mute, invisible, and unable to thank them? It was only then, he added, that I began seriously to question what indescribable force generated them to this activity. Why, too, was I there? What had led me to this time and place? Was it the same force that allowed them to sit serene and unafraid at the epicenter of legal, physical, ethical, and moral chaos? That's the end of the quote. What Nathanson referred to as this force he quickly came to understand was the love of the one true and living God manifest in the lives of God's people. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Brothers and sisters, in the face of the lies, the darkness, and the chaos, that are rapidly overtaking our culture. We must, for the sake of future generations and in steadfast faithfulness to our God, be people of truth and love.
to stand for the truth and to tell the truth at every opportunity and to walk in love born of our understanding and rock solid confidence that Almighty God first loved us. Next week I'll be speaking on the election. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.